All right, uh, good morning, uh, or, or perhaps it is morning as you're watching this, uh, and certainly greetings to all of you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, we are uh, recording this today on Saturday the 15th in anticipation of uh, some winter weather tomorrow, and so we hope you're all warm and safe there at your homes and uh, ready to uh, spend the Sabbath day uh, there as, uh, as uh, individuals or as a family worshiping the Lord. And so we uh, look to provide this uh, service for you today, these elements of worship for you to uh, carry that on there in your home and, and hope that uh, this is a blessing to you. Um, I do want to thank those who came out today on Saturday to help us uh, record this and to provide this uh, for David Underwood doing the recording and the audio, uh, for Katie and her team back here, Bob and Amy Link and Alice Marshall. Uh, so thank you to all of you. Uh, but let's, uh, let's worship the Lord. I, if you're there at your home, I invite you to go ahead and, and let's do the normal worship motion. So stand with me, if you guys would stand with me. Uh, hopefully you've printed a bulletin there, and uh, we'll call one another to worship now from Psalm 8. Uh, I'll read the, uh, uh, the light parts, and you follow along with the bowl. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When we look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen, and also the beast of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Indeed, his name is majestic even on such an occasion as being uh, snowed in. And so we want to give him praise and glory and worship him. Let's do that in song. I encourage you uh, there in your homes to join along. The words will be on the screen. So let's sing together our hymn of adoration, number 274, Thine Be the Glory.
Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks and we praise you that you are the one who, through your son Jesus, has won the victory over sin and death, has shared that victory with those who are in Christ by grace through faith. And we pray, Father, that, uh, that today, as we worship you, that we would exult in that great news, uh, that by your grace you have drawn us to yourself in Christ and have made us co-victors together with him that we have been made heirs as well of righteousness and of eternal life. And so, Father, uh, it is good and right for us to worship you for all these many reasons and many more uh, beyond uh, full expression here today. And so we pray your presence with us now by the Spirit, that you would guide us in our worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, we will still confess our sin together as we uh, do. Um, in our worship. And so if, uh, if you won't, I encourage you certainly to turn with me in your Bibles there in your homes to Romans chapter 13. Um, and our call to confession this morning comes from Romans 13 verses 8 through 10. There Paul writes these words, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law." If you would, bow your heads again, and let's go to the Lord in confession of our sin. Heavenly Father, indeed, we are, uh, we are struck by such words, or we certainly should be. Perhaps when we hear them, we ourselves find that our consciences, our, our hearts are pricked, and rightly so, especially if it is indeed your Spirit who is doing doing the work of drawing a sense of our guilt and shame over some abuse or neglect or other way in which we have failed to love someone this week, maybe even already today. Father, perhaps we even, upon first hearing this word read, thought of others and their sin against us, but do not let us stay there. Do not let this merely be used as uh, a weapon, so to speak, against others, but rather, Father, let it be used as a means of bringing further sanctification and transformation to our hearts. Use your spirit, send your spirit to continue to do that work in us, if indeed we are yours by grace through faith in Jesus. And so, Father, here in just this moment of quiet, I pray that you... Uh, hear our cries from within of those sins that we have come to see, even in just this moment, uh, that we need to confess to you. Thank you for being the Father who loves us, even when we ourselves are not lovable, and yet in Christ, you have delighted in us and have seen fit to make us whole. We praise you, we thank you for that, and we give you glory for the forgiveness of our sins in this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, just to be sure that we are indeed forgiven if we are in Christ, let me read for us from Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. There, Paul writes, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. 
More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the good news that in Christ and through Christ, we have been reconciled to God. Christian, brother, sister in Christ, raise your head high. You are forgiven. Worship well this morning with, uh, with the one who is well pleased with you. Um, let's confess our faith now. Uh, I invite you there in your homes to stand and, and the choir here behind me to stand. And let's confess our faith using together the Westminster Larger Catechism. I've put there in our bulletin questions 46 through 48. So let me, uh, let me lead us in this. What is the estate of Christ humiliation? The, the estate, estate of Christ's humiliation, humiliation was that low condition, condition wherein he, for our sakes, emptying himself of his glory, took upon him the form of a servant in his conception and birth, life, death, and after his death, until his resurrection. How did Christ humble himself in his conception and birth? Christ humbled himself in his conception and birth, in that being from all eternity the Son of God, in the bosom of the Father, he was pleased in the fullness of time to become the Son of Man, made of a woman of low estate, and to be born of her with diverse circumstances of more than ordinary abasement. And then finally, how did Christ humble himself in his life? Christ humbled himself in his life by subjecting himself to the law, which he perfectly fulfilled, and by conflicting with the indignities of the world, temptations of Satan, and infirmities in his flesh, whether common to the nature of man or particularly accompanying his low condition. Thank you. You may be seated. Let me go uh, to the Lord in prayer one more time. And let me, let me do this. Let me encourage you, um, if you are uh, there in your homes worshiping with family or perhaps you've gathered with some others um, in, in this time, uh, let me encourage you uh, to uh, pray along. I'm going to uh, kind of have an opening uh, word and then uh, leave a moment of silence. And, and I think especially given that, that we're worshiping in sort of smaller settings on this occasion, it'd be very fitting for you to pray aloud uh, in those settings and uh, to take those concerns to the Lord together in that um, in your home, either on your own or in whatever community or fellowship you're able to enjoy this morning. So let's pray and uh, keep that in mind as we go through that. Father, even as we um, are uh, riding out the storm perhaps right now or kind of monitoring and seeing how things are, we are mindful of a few things, at least a few things. One, that you are sovereign and that you are in control and that things like winter storms and uh, potential power outages and the like are not beyond your sovereignty and beyond your uh, oversight. In fact, they are well within your will and your purposes and, um, and your uh, again, uh, sovereign dominion and rule. And so, Father, first and foremost, we give you praise and we thank you for who you are. But we also uh, pray to you, knowing your sovereignty, that you would be watching over uh, your people and over the people of this community in which we live, that you would uh, give safety and uh, good health and care to those uh, as we are, uh, again, kind of hunkered down, uh, that you would be mindful of, uh, as we know your word says you are, of those particularly in need, and that you would do so through the means of your people, Father, that you would give to us right now uh, an opportunity to uh, think about and to pray for, and perhaps soon after this service today, to even reach out to others and inquire of them and seek to care for them if we're able to. And so, Father, right now, uh, either in the quiet of our hearts or out loud in our homes, uh, we pray to you for those uh, who come to mind uh, in this time and on this occasion.
Father, I pray for, uh, for Westminster, for us as a body of believers, a fellowship of believers, a community where faith in Christ has drawn us together and our union with him has made us one. I pray that you would continue to strengthen that, that bond. As we uh, had a congregational meeting last week, I pray that that'll be the kind of thing that's a springboard into uh, a renewed uh, joy and delight in one another that it would be a renewed opportunity for us to see how you are at work in us, not just as individuals, but collectively as well. And Father, that you would show us those ways in which you are at work in us and also through us uh, to love and serve the people uh, of this community in which you have placed us and called us, that we would do so with great joy, that we would do so with great hope and anticipation of the ways in which you will uh, move and Uh, bring transformation to people's hearts and to this community even. And we long for uh, eyes to see how you're calling us to do that uh, and for hearts to abide uh, in uh, the comfort of who we are in Christ and to be obedient by the Spirit's leading uh, to the ways in which you are uh, calling us to minister to others. And so, Father, I pray for that uh, in the works of worship and discipleship and evangelism and servanthood all. Uh, that we would do these things to the glory of God. We pray these things and all the prayers of our hearts and souls as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're gonna move into our time of uh, singing uh, the songs of preparation and leading up to the sermon. So if you would please there in your homes, uh, stand and take your bulletins and let's uh, sing along to You Are My All in All and then also As the Deer.
consideration. The word of the Lord from Matthew's gospel, chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Let's pray, and then we'll dive in. Father, we ask your Spirit to give us guidance now. For you to open to us in our minds and hearts to shine the light of illumination by the Spirit, uh, the words of this text, that we would have understanding of it, but not only that, Father, that we would have the, the will and the longing and the desire to put it into practice, to live out the truths that we find in this passage. We pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus was baptized Uh, with John's baptism for repentance, uh, which is a bit of a strange thing to say about Jesus, the Son of God, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, in the flesh, incarnate, but we know him to be without sin, we know him to be perfectly holy, so why in the world would Jesus need to be baptized with the baptism of repentance? Well, it seems John had some understanding similar to what I just expressed, John knew, uh, as we saw last week in the sermon on Matthew chapter one or chapter three, verses one through twelve, that uh, that Jesus was uh, so great that John himself wasn't even fit to carry his sandals, and yet here Jesus comes and says that he wanted to be baptized, that he needed, in really, in many ways, to be baptized, and John tries to prevent it, prevent it. The passage says, verse fourteen, he says, "I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me?" Jesus is here not saying I'm a sinner because nowhere in the passage do we see Jesus confessing sin like those who came to John earlier in the text. But something different is happening. Something, something a little more uh, theologically important even, shall we say. Jesus tells John, it's fitting for us to do this. And he says, the reason why it's fitting for them to do this, in other words, for John to baptize Jesus, is in order to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness. Now, what does Jesus mean there? Well, first of all, let's understand that word fulfill. That's not just there for no reason. In Matthew's gospel, it occurs about 15 times, and on all but two of those occasions, it is expressly the fulfillment of some Old Testament prophecy or like a type that prophesied or figured the coming of Christ, the coming of the Messiah. And it is no different here as one of those 15 times. This word fulfill occurs because there is, in fact, a prophetic type. There is a prophetic passage even that we could look back to I would say several passages and lots of places where that type is sort of built up but one specific passage that we might look to is Isaiah chapter 53 verses 11 and 12 now this comes out of a larger uh, section in Isaiah uh, chapter 52 verse 13 all the way through chapter 53 verse 12 and in that we see this idea of the suffering servant a very famous passage a very well-known passage one that definitely crops up in holy week and Monday Thursday services and good Friday services especially but here it's applicable because it shows us the nature of Christ and the work he came to do and accomplish in the incarnation listen to this in Isaiah 53 beginning at verse 11 The prophet there writes, out of the anguish of his soul, talking about this servant, the suffering servant who's going to come, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death 
and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So here he says, and the prophet Isaiah says, um, that by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, that is the servant of God, make many to be accounted righteousness, and he shall bear their iniquities. So what Isaiah is prophesying there is this, uh, this exchange of unrighteousness, iniquity, for righteousness. So the servant comes and he's full of righteousness and he exchanges that righteousness for the iniquities of those he came to serve and to save. This is a really bad business deal, right? If you're trying to get the better uh, of, of the deal or to have an equal deal. Jesus didn't come to make a, a fair deal in, in a sense because we deserve death and punishment. But what he came to do is say, I'm going to give you my righteousness in exchange for your sin. I who am without sin, I'm going to give to you that righteousness in exchange for the punishment that is due to you for your sin. That's what Paul is getting at in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. When he writes, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Just think about how profound a phrase that is, that, that Paul the apostle writes, which is therefore the word of God, this inspired word of God, that in Christ we become the righteousness of God. And that is, that is phenomenal and amazing. And what is happening here at the baptism of Jesus is that he is inaugurating that reality. He is bringing uh, into sort of symbolic form uh, the reality of what he has come to do, that he has come to identify with us, even in what baptism signifies, which is this need for repentance that Jesus enters into that so that he could so identify with us that this exchange, by our union with him, that this exchange would indeed be a reality. Knox Chamblin puts it this way. He says, at the very threshold of his messianic career, Jesus identifies in the closest way with the sinners whom he has come to save. Jesus identifies in the closest way with the sinners he has come to save. And that is, in many ways, what this baptism of Jesus is about. It's about that righteous exchange, righteousness for unrighteousness, righteousness for sin and iniquity. And Jesus says, that's how we fulfill this. That's how we fulfill all righteousness, the fullness of my righteousness to obey God even to the point of death, and the fullness of your righteousness, which is yours as a gift of grace from God through me to you. All right, so that's the first big thing that we see here is that Jesus' baptism is for that purpose, to fulfill all righteousness. The second thing that kind of goes on here in the passage is that we see that Jesus is God's son. And God specifically says that Jesus is his beloved son. But there's a couple clues here of some other things that are going on that I want to unpack for us. Now, first of all, I want to uh, point something out in the parallel passage in Luke's gospel. So as you, you probably know, most of the Gospels tell us very similar things, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They, they are called the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, they have a lot of shared material. Well, in Matthew chapter 1, you'll remember we had a genealogy of Jesus. Well, Luke also has a genealogy of Jesus. I won't read the whole thing for you today, but you certainly could go and check that out, as you know my own personal fondness for such things. So Matthew starts off um, at Abraham, and he moves all the way through time to Jesus. But Luke starts with Jesus, and he moves back through time and ends his genealogy at Adam. And he ends that genealogy by saying that, that, the, um, uh, that one of Adam's sons was the son of Adam, and that Adam was the son of Adam. God. And guess where Luke puts his genealogy? Matthew's was in chapter 1. Luke put his, puts his at the end of what we know to be Luke chapter 3, right after Jesus is baptized and right after God said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And then for Luke's genealogy to be placed there and then for that genealogy to end with the saying, the son of Adam and Adam was in chronological sense, originally the Son of God. 
Now, Jesus was always the Son of God, I'm not saying that, but, but chronologically, as far as creation goes, Adam was, in that sense, the first Son of God. Not the firstborn Son, but chronologically speaking, the first Son of God. And so, Jesus is this new Adam, this better Adam, a second Adam, or as we might say, the final Adam. Now, what was Adam? Adam was the first king. He was, by God's sovereign declaration, the king and ruler over all creation he was the king and ruler to the ends of the earth now that's an important concept this idea of a royal son a son who is going to be the king the king of kings even David comes along later and fulfills a similar uh, role Um, he was anointed in first Samuel chapter 16 uh, verses 12 through 13 there, the Lord said to uh, Samuel, arise and anoint him, that is David, this eighth son of Jesse, for this is he. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Now that same David later ended up writing a psalm. He wrote a lot of psalms, but he wrote Psalm 2. And in the midst of Psalm 2, verses 7 through 12 especially, there's this There's this concept as God is talking to David, and David is writing this inspired word down, this this poem that is Psalm 2 down. He's talking to David, and he's calling him my son. And he tells him, and he promises him that, that he is going to give to him dominion and rule over the ends of the earth. And yet, in David's lifetime, David never did that. He never was the king of kings. He never was the king over all the boundaries of the earth he was the king of Israel and he expanded those boundaries pretty far and wide for Israel but not to the ends of the earth and so we might read a psalm like this and say well if it's written to David then it didn't come to pass and yet as is the case with many of the prophecies and promises that were given to David it's not in David's lifetime that they were fulfilled it's not in David himself even that they were fulfilled but was in the seed that was within him so to speak is in the one who would come from his line, it is found, its fulfillment is finished and completed and found in Jesus Christ. These words originally spoken to to David find their fulfillment in the one who is the truly anointed king by the Holy Spirit, the one who is truly set apart to be eternally the king of kings and in whom and through whom many sons and daughters come to glory. So that is key to see here that what what God is saying is an indication that Jesus is this royal son. That the hints of that and the and the allusion to Psalm 2 are certainly here. And even the allusion to the idea of of Adam, of Jesus being this uh, this this fulfillment of what it is to be the son of God. Not Adam, but Jesus. Not David, but Jesus. We see also here that Jesus is Uh, the spirit anointed servant messiah so kings would have been anointed back in that day and time in the old testament in david's day and the and the symbol of it would be that the spirit would come upon them it certainly did for david and and here with jesus we see that that concept as god the father declares this is my beloved son with him i am well pleased in the spirit of god the third person of the trinity so we get the whole trinity here right father son and holy spirit the spirit comes down and if you would anoints him comes upon him in the form of a dove we see that also in old testament prophecy In Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, Isaiah there writes, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. In other words, this tree that was the tree of Jesse, the tree of David, if you would, has been cut down. But from that stump, Isaiah says, a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. If we go a little further into Isaiah chapter 42 verse 1, again Isaiah says, Behold my servant. So this servant is the same promised Messiah, the same promised Davidic king that would come out of that stump of Jesse. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. You see, for David and for the lineage of kings that came after David, so many of those kings clearly were not anointed by the Holy Spirit. 
They might have had oil poured on their heads, but they did not fulfill their obligation as kings. And so the line of David, if you would, was chopped off like that tree in the image that Isaiah sees in Isaiah 11. But not forever. The stump still had life in it. And out of it came this shoot that bore fruit. And that shoot, we were told, was anointed by the Holy Spirit. And the promise of that shoot is fulfilled in Jesus. He is the one who really bears fruit. Unlike all the fruitless kings before him, Jesus is the king who does indeed bear fruit because the Spirit of the Lord is completely and fully in him and upon him and with him. And therefore, he is equipped to bring forth justice to the nations. Knox Chamberlain says, by this joining of Isaiah 42, 1, and we could argue Isaiah 11, 1 and 2 as well, to Psalm 2, 7. So the idea of the royal son together with this spirit-anointed Messiah servant, the joining of those two things here in Matthew 3, 17 in the declaration of what God the Father says expounds the character of Jesus' kingship. So think about this. This is what Chamberlain says. He says, because of this, he is the servant king, a regal figure so secure in who he is, the father's son. He's the father's son that he is free to serve rather than tyrannize his subjects and to deal gently rather than harshly with the lowliest and weakest of them. Astonishingly, it is by the very means of his lowly service that all earthly tyrants will be subdued and all nations made his possessions. So think about what Chamberlain's saying there. So Jesus is so secure in who he is, his person, that he is the son of God and, and the beloved son and the royal son and the spirit anointed servant son. He's so secure in that that he doesn't then make his kingdom uh, a tyrannical dominion. But rather, it's characterized by lowliness and gentleness. Jesus is the one who said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's, when's the last time you heard one of our, one of our politicians say something like that? No, what we tend to see is the insecurity we tend to see the results of, if I don't give them what they want, I'm going to get voted out. Even if I can't keep the promises. And even if I'm also making backroom deals with those who are giving me lots and lots of money. But see, Jesus isn't needing to chase after such acclamation from the crowds, nor is he needing to chase after the affirmation of, uh, of the powerful. Because he has, he has all the security he needs in the fact of who he is, that he's God the Son, the Son of God, the royal Son at that, the beloved Son, the Spirit-anointed Son. That brings us to this last point of his mission as the beloved Son. And again, there's, there's a passage in the Old Testament that, that gives us uh, a hint at exactly what God's beloved Son was going to do and what God was going to call him to do and to be. In the Old Testament, there is an example of, uh, of one of God's people who has a son that is beloved. In Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, we read this. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, in other words, your beloved son Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So God went to Abraham, his, his patriarch servant, his, his man, right? And God had promised Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to make you a nation. And I'm going to make you the father, not just of a nation, but of many nations. But now God was saying, and I want you to take that son, the beloved son of yours, and I want you to sacrifice him. But God didn't hold him to that. We know that when Abraham got to the top of Mount Moriah, that God had provided a substitute sacrifice in Isaac's place. But we read that passage in its original context and we find it perhaps to be strange, but it finds its fulfillment like all the types and, and prophecies and promises and, and, and mysteries of the Old Testament. It finds its fulfillment in Jesus when God says, this is my beloved son, with him I am well pleased, there is this 
hint, this allusion back to Isaac and Abraham. It is like God saying, I am going to make the sacrifice of him that I, that I alluded to all the way back there with Abraham's beloved son. Just, just as I did not require your father, Abraham, to make that ultimate sacrifice, yet I will make it for you by giving you my beloved son, Jesus. And this is the one with whom I am well pleased because he's going to fulfill all righteousness and not just go into the waters of baptism that he doesn't deserve or need, but he's gonna go to the cross in your place, though he doesn't deserve it nor need it. This is the one with whom God was well pleased. And let me just say this about that. We can say, well, yeah, I get it. I mean, I, I, I'm well pleased with my children most of the time. Um, and, and, and in a certain sense, all the time, I'm always well pleased with them in, in the sense that they're my children, my sons and my daughter. But that's not, that's not the totality of what we can glean from this statement about Jesus. Certainly as, as the second person of the Trinity and as God incarnate, we can grasp why God would say he's well pleased with Jesus. But there's an implication for us, not that we're trying to make it all about us, but there, there's an implication here of the work of Christ that's, uh, that's going to come uh, in his lifetime. In other words, that God is well pleased with his beloved son Jesus is really good news for us. Because here's what it means. If we are in Christ, if we are ourselves united with Christ by grace through faith, then guess what? God is well pleased with us too. Not because of us, not because of anything we've done, not because we are ourselves righteous, but because he who is righteous has joined with us by grace. He has imputed his righteousness to us and is by the Spirit's work in us imparting his righteousness to us so that when God looks upon us, he sees sons and daughters blessed by the righteousness of Christ because of our union with him. And so the good news for us is when we see and hear God saying, this is my beloved son, with him I'm well pleased, that we then know that God the Father delights in us because of his delight for the son. Now let me pause there and ask this question. Do you have a hard time really believing that truth you have a hard time really resting in this truth that God delights in you because of his love for his son and because you are in union with his son through faith you have a difficult time with that do you have a hard time believing that God's delight and love for you is eternally secure in Jesus that you don't have to earn it and that you can't repay it and that Jesus has totally covered the cost. And because he is so pleasing to the Lord, you are now pleasing to the Lord. This is one of the most difficult things that, that so many people that I've pastored over the years deal with. They have a really hard time, even believers have a really hard time letting go of the sense that they have to be good enough. It might be that you are a successful, attractive, charismatic uh, kind of person. Maybe, maybe you've got a business or maybe you're just uh, involved in certain you know, social things or community things that make you kind of an important person, a big deal. And whether it's at, at work or in your home life or in your church involvement, there is this sense that you are pleasing God because you are achieving such great things that God is pleased to have you on his team shall we say because you're so good you're such a great asset such a good team member and if that's your outlook I dare say if it hasn't happened yet it will soon that there is this gnawing inner fear that you're just not quite good enough I mean, on the outside, you give the impression to everybody, like, you've got it all under control, you, you, you are all that and a bag of chips, as the saying when I was younger went. But on the inside, you are scared to the core that it's just not enough and that, and that before God, you've just got, you've got more to do. And the gospel tells you this, you don't. Because of his beloved son with whom he's well pleased, 
if you have put your faith in him, then he's well pleased with you and he loves you. Maybe you are, maybe that's not your story. Maybe your story isn't, I've got it all together. I know what I'm doing. Maybe your story is that you know you're kind of a mess up. Maybe that's not even the nice word you think about yourself. Maybe you use different terms to name it. Maybe it's because growing up you had a difficult circumstance, maybe with your parents or maybe with the coach or who knows what. Maybe it was neglect or maybe it was um, outsized expectations or maybe it was even some, some kind of abuse of some sort. But whatever it is, you have this compulsion to just always think and feel that you are insignificant, that you are not worth looking at, that you are not valuable in any way, shape, or fashion. And this passage is telling you that if you are in Christ, that you are loved by the Father in heaven. That you are not worthless, that you do have value, that you do matter, that you do mean something. I could list over and over and over countless other examples of those who, for one reason or another, look at it and say, this can't be true of me. God can't delight in me. God can't love me. And here's the reality of the gospel. In Christ, he does. In Jesus, he does. And so take heart in that and find joy in that. Find solace and peace and comfort in that. And then finally, we come to this, that Jesus' baptism depicts the genesis or the beginning of the new creation. There's all kinds of symbolism in the Bible, right? Things that, that signify this, that, or the other. Well, Jesus getting baptized is that. It's the, it's the symbol, if you would, or it's this uh, signification. That's not a real word, but uh, it's, it's this dawning of a new day. And so think back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In, in, in the very beginning of the Bible, it says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So think about a couple of things that are similar here. We've got Jesus going down into what? Into waters. And waters in the Old Testament always symbolize at least chaos, if not death. So we've got um, a new creation in the sense that there's a, there's, a, there's a descending into death idea here for Jesus. But then there's also this idea of a, a new birth, a, a new life that's going to come from it. But also in that Genesis passage, we had the Spirit hovering over the waters. And what is it that takes place here at Jesus' baptism? But the Spirit comes down and rests upon Jesus himself. And so there's this idea that Jesus then is this dawn, he's this genesis of a new creation. And that theme is uh, fleshed out more fully throughout the rest of the New Testament. This also is really good news for us. Back in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we looked at 2 Corinthians 5, 21 just a few moments ago. But in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. Just like I said, it's really good news for us that Jesus is the beloved son of God, which means now we are beloved sons and daughters of God in Christ. So too, if Jesus is the dawn of the new creation, then what are we who are in Jesus but new creation? We are made new. The old has gone. The new has come. So if the old has really gone, then here's, here's the reality. Then you're not defined by your sin. The guilt of it doesn't remain. And neither need the shame of it ultimately remain. You're not defined by your failures and shortcomings. Let's say you were the pastor of a church somewhere and that there was a snowstorm coming and you needed to get word out to everybody that it was, that it was there's not going to be in-person worship. And let's say you sent an email out with the wrong date on it. That was a failure. That could cause trouble. You could think, well, there's no hope for me now. The session's probably going to fire me as soon as this recording is finished. But if you're in Christ, then even if they do, then you know that you are a new creation, that, that the old has gone, and that's not going to be the defining thing about you in eternity. That there is hope for you in this Christ who is himself, not just the dawn, but the consummation of that new creation. Not only has the old gone, but the really good news is also that the new has come. That the same spirit who alighted upon Jesus has come upon us and has dwelt and is dwelling within us 
And in coming into us, he has brought regeneration. That is new life. That is Genesis, if you would, a, a, a new birth. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 7 deals with that. I won't go and read that, but write that down. Go back and look at it. Titus 3, 4 and 7 talks about being regenerated by the Spirit. Adoption. That we've been made ourselves to be sons and daughters in Christ. Also the work of the Spirit, taking this accomplished work of Christ and applying it to us. Making it real in our hearts and souls before the throne of God above the Father himself in heaven. Sanctification. In Galatians, I will read this one. In Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 25, we read this. But the fruit of the Spirit is... <clears throat> now... It says, but there, because before that is this list of things not to do. These are the works of the flesh, Paul says. The law speaks against those things, but the fruit of the Spirit, Paul says, this one who's at work in your life by the indwelling presence he has brought to you is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So the Spirit that came upon Jesus, that anointed him as the Messiah, as the King, that showed to the world these truths that were eternally true, but, but revealed them in this magnificent way, that same Spirit has come upon us if we are indeed walking in the Spirit, if we are indeed Christ's by grace through faith. And then finally, the Spirit gives us gifts when my kids were little, they used to watch Thomas, when my boys especially, they used to watch Thomas the Train. And there was this saying that, that I felt like happened a lot. I don't really remember. It just, maybe they watched the same one over and over. And so I just had this phrase in my head. But Thomas said of himself, and people would say to Thomas, you're a very useful engine, Thomas. You're a very useful engine. And what the Spirit tells us is something similar. We're not useful because... We, in and of ourselves, have so much to offer God. But the Spirit who has anointed Jesus, that same Spirit who has been sent to us by Jesus, has shared with us and bestowed upon us gifts and talents that we are to use and be useful in the kingdom, in the church, in this world for the glory of God. So those times when you might yourself feel useless or not valuable, think about this, that the Spirit of God who showed us the eternal worth of Jesus has now bestowed on you by grace a worth and value and usefulness even to serve Him and to love Him and to glorify Him, that is God, and to serve and love and, and watch over one another in the church and those to the ends of the earth even. So these are all things we can glean from here. These are good news words for us to put into practice. That Jesus baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus anointed to show that he is indeed the royal son, the beloved son, the spirit anointed Messiah servant. All that we ourselves might know and embrace and trust that we are loved and valuable and useful if we are Christ. Let's give thanks to God for that and let's live this reality out in the days ahead. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you and ask your blessing upon us that we might live this out uh, and, and put to practice these truths we have studied here today and considered here this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Katie and her team are going to come back up in just a moment and lead us in the singing of the last hymn. And so I encourage you to follow along there in your homes. Uh, thank you and God bless you.
All right, now receive the Lord's blessing there in your homes as you watch this morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace today and forevermore. Amen.